Item number SCP-ES-234 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures Due to the nature of SCP-ES-234, containment protocol focused on voluntary housing of the instance in Site-34 facilities. It has been provided with a modified humanoid containment cell, equipped for housing a small feline. Although the cell has a sandbox, the instance has shown a preference for using the toilet present in the chamber. The instance should receive standard small cat food three times a day, plus snacks as a reward for collaboration and interviews and experimental procedures. Additionally, a maximum of 30 grams per week of dehydrated Nepeta cateria, having to distribute its use in a minimum period of five days per week, not being authorized under any circumstance the delivery of additional quantities also known as catnip, or cat mint, will be provided. SCP-ES-234 must interact with personnel participating in the project at least once a day, and must receive veterinary evaluation once every two months. All interactions must be recorded by video or audio recorders. In order to limit its exposure to the outside world, it will be allowed to travel through certain sections of Site-34 and this travel must be discreetly supervised by personnel participating in the project, in order to prevent it from accessing restricted areas, or areas that pose a danger to its own physical, psychological, or ontological integrity or that of staff members. In the event of a Kalahiro incident, the level of surveillance in the media and on the internet will be increased in order to search for mentions of uncontrolled noir events and response teams will be sent to recover SCP-ES-234 and distribute amnestics to the witnesses, disseminating the corresponding cover stories. At present, the aim is to reduce uncontrolled noir events through the application of the Maltese Falcon Protocol. For further details, see Addendum ES-234-01. Efforts continue to be made to establish the origin of the information obtained and mentioned by SCP-ES-234, as well as possible uses for it. SCP-ES-234 corresponds to a conceptual ontogenetic gestalt entity of variable appearance, which is currently perceived as a specimen of a male adult domestic cat, Felis sylvestris catus, of approximately five years of age. A Gestalt entity is an entity whose observable characteristics are partially the result of the perception and consciousness of the observer. The most notable anomalous characteristics observed in this entity correspond to its capacity for bipedal locomotion and speech. The examinations carried out at the time have not allowed us to find any notable anatomical differences in relation to non-abnormal specimens of Fellow Sylvester's Caddis, which could explain these capacities. According to testimonies obtained from subjects who have interacted with SCP-ES-234, the entity would be able to obtain information related to its interlocutor, either of a personal nature or in relation to problems that affect them in other areas, information that they make known during the conversation, on many occasions outside of clear context. The mechanism through which SCP-ES-234 would obtain the information has not yet been identified. When asked, how it obtains when asked how it obtains information, SCP-ES-234 simply says that, quote, it is thanks to his detective skills, unquote, and, quote, that a good investigator never betrays his sources, unquote. A secondary property associated with the entity is a phenomenon with ontokinetic characteristics called a noir event. During this event, an area of 10 meters squared around the entity is affected, registering a notorious chromatic alteration in the objects and people present in the place, being their characteristic colors replaced by different tonalities of white, black, and gray, registering also a decrease in the level of luminosity present in the place. In addition, alterations in the clothing, language, and mannerisms of the subjects have been observed inside the area affected by the phenomenon becoming anachronistic and consistent with those used by SCP-ES-234 during this event, which will revert to normal characteristics once the phenomenon is over. They are similar in style to those used in films of the 1940s 
and in American-made television series of the 1950s and 60s. SCP-ES-234 is repeatedly stated that it does not know the cause of this phenomenon or the reasons that trigger it. Addendum 1 Kalahero Incidents and the Establishment of Protocol Maltese Falcon The Foundation learned about SCP-ES-234 after a series of reports about the presence of the entity in barracks and scenes of police investigation in the city of… After the initial contact was established, it was contained, and the cover story was spread that the events observed corresponding to the recording of a television series, The Cat Detective, and amnestics were distributed among the subjects directly involved. Although SCP-ES-234 had voluntarily agreed to stay at the Foundation's facilities, security personnel reported in the weeks following their entry successive breaches of containment by the entity, returning to the facilities after a period of one to three days attending noir events outside the facilities of the Foundation, breaches that were called Kalahero events. Apparently, these breaches are not due to an abnormal capacity, but simply to the small size and dexterity of the entity. When the entity was interviewed about the reason for these escapes and, consequently, non-compliance with the agreement established by the Foundation, SCP-ES-234 limited itself to mentioning that, quote, I cannot fail to comply with my detective duties. Crime never rests, and neither can I." Unquote. Further mentioning that, quote, I was not born to be a pencil pusher. It was in the streets, and not behind a desk where clues were obtained and crimes were solved. Unquote. In response to these events, the Maltese Falcon Protocol was established in collaboration with the Disinformation Department. SCP-ES-234 was informed that, as of, it would work in collaboration with the research agency SPNC Associates. For the execution of this protocol, personnel from the Foundation, in collaboration with external agents, carry out representations of police cases, allowing the entity to participate in the investigative processes. Thanks to the establishment of this protocol, the incidence of uncontrolled noir events was reduced by 80%. Addendum 2 Interview with SCP-ES-234 Interviewee SCP-ES-234 Investigator Dr. Borja Dowell, Member of the Regional Ethics Committee Preamble This record corresponds to the transcript of one of the interviews conducted at SCP-ES-234 in the context of searching for information about the source of its anomalous properties. It can be highlighted that during the development of the interview, a noir event occurred. Began log, Monday, January 20, 2020, 10 hundred hours. Good morning, SCP-ES-234. I am Borja Dowell. I have come to interview you as part of a process of general evaluation of abnormal subjects housed in this place. Morning, Dowell. Not worried about talking to a talking cat? Dowell denies it. Seems not. You must know others like me. What was I called in for today? A new job from SPNC? I could really use it. I've been so bored these last few days. SCP-ES-234, raising its front right paw. You've come here for information. Seems like that's all they need before these days. If it's about that file you're looking for since last week. File ES-162-05-01 is in the possession of researcher Mondragon, who requested it a couple of months ago from your assistant Perez, who was transferred a month ago, after which he forgot to inform you. Thanks, I guess. I'll check back with you later. Since you mentioned it, tell me, how did you know? It is simple logic, my dear Dal. Since from what I've been able to find out the last few months, you, as members of every respectable research group, never allow your folders to leave the place. Consequently, and associating the area of work with which that file related, Mondragon was the most likely candidate to have it in his possession. Not to mention that you changed your assistant in the last month. So it is very likely that your new assistant had no knowledge about that loan. On another subject, SCP-ES-234, do you have any idea how long you've had these capabilities? Are you referring to my detective skills, or being a talking cat? Since I remember, it has always been like that. 
In the litter we were five, three males and two females. We talked among ourselves and with our mother, a beautiful calico. We lived happily until that day. What happened on that day? That's when I lost two of my brothers. They were kidnapped, and we never heard from them again. It was after that day, without heeding my mother's pleas, that I took to the streets, first in search of them, and then seeking to prevent the same thing from happening to others. I always get sad when I tell this. Now, with your permission, I need a cigarette. I know they are a bad habit, but they help me to relax and concentrate. SCP-ES-234 pulls out a small silver cigarette case from the inside pocket of its jacket and takes out a cigarette, lighting it with a small golden lighter. These cigarettes are composed of nepeta. Authorities have expressed the entity possesses a strong dependence on their consumption and fear of the consequences of quitting. It has been allowed to continue with their use. SCP-ES-234 lights another cigarette. Dal takes out a pack of Marlboro cigars from his raincoat and starts smoking. Borja Dal has expressed himself as a non-smoker. After the event, it was not possible to find the remaining cigarettes in his possession. They both remain smoking in silence for one minute, after which SCP-ES-234 starts talking again. Hey, Dal. I have something to ask you. What happened to the Ruski? I was hoping to see him today. Dismissive way of referring to the Russians during the 1950s and 60s. What Ruski? Russian? You mean Antonov? I think even though his last name sounds Russian, he's actually of Polish or Ukrainian descent. Ruski, Polish, that's irrelevant. They're all… At least he's not a commie. Whatever. I don't trust Ruskies, but he was an exception. I was hoping to see him, but I'll have to tell you first. Don't trust South Americans. Excuse me, SCP-ES-234? That's right. Watch out for the South Americans. They're playing a double game. And please stop calling me that. My name is Mar. The entity continues to smoke in silence for a few minutes, after which the noir event ends. End log. Monday, January the 20th of 2020, 10.48 hours. Note, the information relating to file ES-162-05-01 was confirmed shortly after the end of the interview. The others, Section Censored, Special Authorization Level 3 or higher is required for access to the complete file. Addendum 3, Pan Incident. On February 10th, 2020, SCP-ES-234 started a new Kalahero event, losing contact with Foundation staff until February 15, 2020, being found with medium-severe injuries inside a church in. Later, the instance returned to appear in a Kalahero event, achieving its recovery on March 5, 2020, along with obtaining. As a result of this event. The security levels of the SCP-ES-234 containment unit were increased, and several of the privileges previously obtained were also revoked. For more details, see document ES-234-02-03 PAN. Addendum 4 Further Communications in Relation to SCP-ES-234 Date March 12, 2020 To Borja Dowell From Director, just as it is undeniable that SCP-ES-234's attitude has been problematic on multiple occasions, so has its usefulness, providing us with information of some value on several occasions. And I cannot fail to mention that, as unorthodox as its methods were, they allowed us to obtain after the Pan Incident. Consequently, if we cannot suppress our hunting impulses, their inexhaustible curiosity, and their desire to investigate and collaborate, why not channel them? I understand that the entity is clearly anomalous, and that we still don't know much about its nature. It's a cat that thinks it's a detective, or at least something that we see in that way. However, is our rejection of the incomprehensible so much that we are willing to simply throw it at the bottom of a box and forget it? Furthermore, by giving it a special status, 
and greater participation in the activities of the site, we would diminish the chances that one day it will simply not return, or even worse, that it will be made public or fall into the hands of another organization. March 30, 2020 To Director From Borja Dowell SCP-ES-234 being a thinking and non-hostile entity, it would be unfortunate to have to perform its termination. Moreover, there is so much we must learn about its nature. One aspect that the entity's own research team has tended to underestimate is its capacity to obtain information, something that certainly and even against SCP-ES-234's own beliefs is not the result of its intellectual and research capacity. Many times so many pieces are missing that it is practically impossible to obtain a valid deduction. Is it a kind of radio that captures information indiscriminately, or does it possess metacognitive characteristics that are even more difficult to characterize? The idea of the research agency SPNC fits so well with its personal vision of the reality of SCP-ES-234 that even with its abilities, it cannot reject it especially when it is experiencing a noir event and its paradigm is reduced to a crime novel. Although these events have been self-contained, with a limited scope and duration, what would happen if the entity got fed up with the transitions in its existence, and consequently decided on that occasion not to drag a building or a street into that novel scenario, but the entire world, or worse still, not to allow us to return to what you know is our reality? I have discussed this scenario at length, not only with members of the Associated Project and the Disinformation Department, but also with experts in anomalous ontology and memetics, and together we have come up with a possible solution. To offer you an alternative so attractive that it makes your idealized world of crime novels, mysterious crime scenes, tenacious cops and mysterious blondes who break hearts dull and boring, deriving you of the desire to return. And what better option than our own work? We do not pursue simple criminals, but entities capable of murdering even concepts. We do not love mysterious blondes, but immortal guardian goddesses. For obvious reasons we cannot give you an agent's position. However, assigning you Class E status and participation in specific tasks would be a good start. Date: April 1, 2020 2. Borja Dal, from Director Dal, even though this is fucking crazy and has risk associated with it, I think it can work. Let's welcome Detective Marr to the team. Item number SCP 007 INT Level 4 Secret Containment Class Esoteric Secondary Class Domiel Disruption Class Blam Risk Class Warning Special Containment Procedures SCP-007-INT instances are currently contained in Site-B Toria and Site-PT-4. Studies are being conducted by a liaison group of researchers from the Italophone and Lucifone branches of the Foundation presently head of a Dr. Pietra Ferreira. SCP-007-INT instances are contained within stainless steel vacuum cylinders, adapted with seals in order to maintain the anomaly within an environment absent of oxygen. The vacuum cylinders are kept within standard welded airtight special purpose containers, specifically for the transportation and containment of SCP-007-INT instances. The containers are secured inside a protected vault with the resistance grade rated 6, under intermittent electronics audio-visual surveillance. According to the normative of the European Resistance Standards, a vault that has a resistance value to breach of 400, 2 locks, and resistance against explosives, on top of its ordinary qualities, such as resistance to environmental damage. Hazardous materials, hazmat suits, equipped with self-contained breathing apparatuses, adapted as NIJ Level 2 body armors, rated Level 2 at knife resistance and spike protection, and electroshock weaponry, are available for the rapid response containment teams. 
body armor capable of protecting against 9mm and 357 Magnum projectiles at velocities of up to 398 meters per second plus minus 9.1 meters per second and 436 meters per second plus minus 9.1 meters per second respectively body armor capable of protecting against strike energies up to 50 joules the vacuum cylinders and the containers are equipped with safety mechanisms accessible only to personnel with clearance level 3/007 INT a minimum of one individual, capable of controlling the specific instance of SCP-007 INT, must be present intermittently throughout testing periods. Deployment of SCP-007 INT may only occur inside the particular testing course developed for the object, or in extraordinary circumstances of field use, sanctioned by the Lucifone Board of Directors, or in the superintendents of the Italian branch. Additionally. In the case of containment failure, and if no eligible operators are available to restrain the object inside the cylinder, instances of SCP-007 INT may be forced into its training course, which may be turned into a temporary vacuum chamber. SCP-007 INT designates an intelligent, highly adaptable, translucent, perpetually congealed substance that exhibits extraordinary plastic malleability. The object exists in the form of four individual instances, Alpha 4.5 kg, Beta 8.5 kg, Gamma 6.5 kg, and Omega 15.5 kg, completely comprised thereof. These constructs are capable of complex movement, and can reach speeds of approximately 25 km per hour. The object itself possesses an outstanding capability to build kinetic energy through its movement speed. Additionally, the object acts as a superacid when interacting with animal matter. As per the modern definition, a superacid is a medium that presents the chemical potential of its protons as higher than that of pure sulfuric acid. While inert in an environment without the presence of oxygen, SCP-007 INT will enter a state analogous to hibernation. The longevity of SCP-007 INT instances is currently unknown, given their self-renewal mechanisms. Instances of SCP-007 INT lack nuclei and tissue components, presenting themselves as amorphous amalgams centered around imaginary cores. The object possesses an idiosyncratic physical model with ordinary fluid mechanics, such as characteristics of a Newtonian fluid and a gel, in conjunction with anomalous environmental interactions, such as the capability of levitating upwards to two meters from its initial position, despite being heavier than the air. Consequently, SCP-007 INT may be manipulated through hydraulic pressure into different shapes and sizes, by expanding or compressing itself, with variable physical characteristics. Peculiarities such as viscosity and sharpness, ranging from known ideal and abstract objects, shapes, geometrical formats to additional appendages, such as pseudopods. SCP-007 INT possesses a specific strength ten times higher than that of stainless steel. It is resilient to a number of physical hazards, including resistance to temperatures between 80 degrees Celsius to minus 80 degrees Celsius. Kinetic and stress damage 613 kN per kilogram SCP-007 INT is exceptionally weak to electrical damage attaining only temporary resistance to electricity based stress after being subjected to the hazard ranging between approximately 30 and 90 seconds during direct physical interactions between SCP-007 INT and organisms pertaining to the Metazoa biological kingdom, including its several phyla, and some species of fungi, the object demonstrates properties similar to that of a superacidic digestive fluid. The process synthesizes matter into a temporary mass, in addition to an instance's original structure, exceeding mass decays at a rate of approximately 0.5 kg per hour without creating detritus or byproducts. Instances are capable of reporting the exceeding mass into ephemeral copies of themselves, though these copies possess inferior material qualities. Additionally, 
instances of SCP-007-INT can reproduce asexually through a process similar to mitosis by using the additional synthesized mass. The circumstances associated with such an event are under scrutiny. Instance Alpha created Instance Beta asexually after consuming several kilograms of matter during an experiment conducted in Site Vitoria. See experimental log for details. The circumstances of the event were replicated, but reproduction was unsuccessful. SCP-007-INT displays a degree of consciousness, sentience, and sapience. It is capable of exhibiting reactions to stimuli associated with visual, olfactory, and auditory systems. These pseudo-systems are homogeneously distributed throughout SCP-007-INT's physical form, memorizing and learning through habituation, observational, and social means. The object employs a process of heuristics to rationalize solutions. Different instances display different peculiarities, such as a fondness for certain objects of affection thereof. It is apparent that instances of SCP-007-INT are aware of their lethality, and will not attempt to initiate physical contact with animals to display endearment. Moreover, instances of SCP-007-INT are capable of forming relationships with certain individuals through a tacit contractual connection. Once this specific form of relationship is established, the respective instance of SCP-007-INT will reset from its ordinary behavior and adapt the psychophysical inputs of the selected individual designated an operator. Operators are capable of instructing the object omnidirectionally even without a line of sight with SCP-007-INT instances, as long as the respective instance of SCP-007-INT they have established a connection to remains within a 40-meter range of the controller. Only one operator per instance may take active control thereof, but several may exist at a time. Control can be transferred to another eligible operator. Field Report Recovery Site PT-7 Department of Archivology Director of Bibliographic Archives Transcription Log for the Operational Report NR-6 from the Task Force Smoking Anomalous Snakes I remember that day. Something about the fascists producing anomalous weaponry. Our detachment was pretty advanced in Massarosa, yeah. We were the vanguard. And the reconnaissance team. Neat, huh? It'd be cooler if we weren't the only ones available for the job. Yes, everything went alright, until the moment a man appeared with some sort of balloon floating ominously near himself. Didn't seem like a Reggio Esercito uniform. Had this type of full bodysuit. No, it wasn't an armor but reminded me of one of those beekeeper vests, you know? Anyways, so the man started pointing at us and saying something in Italian. I think he told us to fuck off or something. Naturally, we opened fire. No fascist is going to tell us what to do, a real one at that. The thing is, that balloon thing just spread itself in front of him like a sheet or something. Our bullets just hit it flat. The thing didn't even flinch or something. So we shot it more. And then it shot us. Not kidding. The thing just hurled into us, crashed on, and started to absorb the poor guy. I still remember his screams. We changed magazines as fast as we could, but that Italian man started running away, so we sent our tacit goodbye to right in the dome and started to pursue. It's hard to follow a guy in narrow labyrinthic streets. Even worse when you have an apparently unstoppable murder machine following you. Thank God that shit couldn't get much speed. We pretty much fucked the stealth up, but that thing didn't seem to mind wasting time eating some fascist. Bless indiscriminate murder, I guess. Due to a stroke of luck, we managed to pepper him with some bullets. Guy left a trail of blood for us to follow. Not so lucky, that fucking thing stormed through a house, now enormous, and rendezvoused with him. We hoped that guy would die due to blood loss or something, so we stood back as he ran away. Not long after, we resumed the search. Funny thing, we found smaller versions of that balloon thingy going around the streets. Those died with bullets for some reason. Our shot shredded them or something. We decided not to touch it, given what happened with… Then we found the entrance to a cellar, got down some stairs to a type of laboratory, if you could even call the place that. 
found the guy patching himself up, a briefcase, and a huge air cylinder next to him. He said more shit, so we shot him. Right, dead men can't be interrogated, but it was complete self-defense. The guy had a gun, probably insulted our mothers, and the man-eating balloon of death thing was nowhere to be seen. The place had some sort of tunnel leading out of the village, and a small cart to carry the cylinder. We searched around, found some documents, and with a little effort to understand Italian, mind you, it is harder than you think, we realized that our mission was complete, seized the whole thing, and dispatched it to Brazil. Better have that thing in our hands instead of some crazy fascist or Nazi, right? Communication between the CL-5 Council and the S-5 Council Site PT-1 Overwatch Council Cabinet Office Extraordinary Communique from the Lucifone Board of Directors Excellent S-5-6 and the other members of the Superintendent Council This missive is accompanied by our best regards. A cache containing an object of interest, with the appended documentation including the byproducts of our research. We consider that these items of interest possess a notorious historical and scientific value for the Italophone Office of the Foundation, an intriguing anomaly pertaining to your predecessors that was recovered by the Brazilian Expeditionary Force. Given the circumstances, we decide to update its designation to SCP-007-INT. Cordially. This document has been electronically signed by the 6th Director of the Lucifone Board of Directors, CL-5-6. Site Vitoria, Superintendent Command, Superintendent Office, Minutes of International Communication from the Superintendent Council, Esteemed CL-5-6, I wish to thank you and the rest of the CL-5 for the letter, and the cash you sent us. In our last meeting, the S-5 Council has revealed the content of your message, and decided to start a project to better understand SCP-007-INT. In, in order to do so, we sent orders to both the Archive of the Italian Branch to find as many documents about SCP-007-INT as we can, and to the Research Department to analyze its chemical composition and properties. Also. S-5-05 was intrigued to discover that the anomaly possesses degrees of sentience, and started a smaller research project to evaluate how it does respond to stimulation in various states. I also wish to inform you that the Italian branch may have come into contact with something similar to SCP-007-INT, a weapon developed by the Fascist Council of the Occult classified as SCP-009-IT. We shall investigate for eventual similarities, and inform you of any relevant findings. Cordially. This document has been electronically signed by S-5-6, Superintendent for the Italian Foundation. Site PT-1 Overwatch Council Cabinet Office Extraordinary Communique from the Lucifone Board of Directors Excellent S-5-6 and the other members of the Superintendent Council. We received your kind word with great satisfaction. While scrutinizing our archives for additional documental records regarding the object, we made an equally intriguing discovery. Our predecessor in Portugal, the Scientific Academy of the Anomalous, possessed several documents detailing a very similar anomaly under the alias Onderoy, associated with studies regarding a project codenamed MEL. An incident with the latter, involving rogue agents, forced the project under strict confidentiality. Documental sources imply that the anomaly was acquired during a collaborative effort between the Academy and the Institute. Further investigation revealed that the two instances housed in our Portuguese facilities were perfect matches to the one instance delivered to Italy. Unbeknownst, we had contained the same anomalous object, but under different aliases. These documents will be made available as soon as possible. Cordially. This document has been electronically signed by the 6th Director of the Lucifone Board of Directors, CL-5-6. Site Vitoria, Superintendent Command, Superintendent Office, Minutes of International Communication from the Superintendent Council, Esteemed CL-5-6, I regret to inform you that our research in the archives was unsuccessful, 
and that no information regarding SCP-007-INT was found. We theorize that, when the CFO escaped from the Foundation, its members managed to steal the documents about SCP-007-INT from the archives, so that we were left without any knowledge of its existence. This is corroborated by the fact that analysis between samples of SCP-009-IT and SCP-007-INT have demonstrated a correspondence of 92.75%. This, alongside the most recent discoveries about SCP-009-IT's functioning mechanism, led us to believe that the CFO was able to both replicate and improve SCP-007-INT, turning it into a far more stable and controllable weapon. We shall keep studying both anomalies, and inform you of any developments. Cordially. This document has been electronically signed by S5-6, Superintendent for the Italian Foundation. Site PT-1, Overwatch Council, Cabinet Office, Extraordinary Communique from the Lucifone Board of Directors, Excellent S5-6, and the other members of the Superintendent Council. The CFO seems like a formidable opponent. In lieu of the recent advancements, the Board deliberated and concluded that the creation of an official joint initiative for the purpose of researching this anomaly would be invaluable, potentially allowing for a paratechnological breakthrough with our combined resources. Should the superintendents deem this project fit, we shall do the necessary for the maintenance thereof. Cordially. This document has been electronically signed by the 6th Director of the Lucifone Board of Directors, CL-5-6. Site Vitoria, Superintendent Command, Superintendent Office, Minutes of International Communication from the Superintendent Council, Esteemed CL-5-6, Indeed, the CFO represents the greatest threat to the Foundation in our jurisdiction, and has been causing issues since the creation of our branch. However, this letter has not been written to complain about our problems, but to inform you about the progress made with SCP-007-INT. S5-05 and his team had the SCP-007-INT instance in our possession linked with a lobotomized subject to minimize the risk of a breach, and observe its behavior in various situations. These include threats to the subject, isolation, and problems of varying complexity. In all cases, SCP-007-INT showcased basic forms of empathy and altruism by protecting the subject from harm and trying to comfort him while alone. Your proposal has been discussed and unanimously approved by the superintendents. We began selecting the appropriate personnel for the project. We shall wait for your answer before taking any further steps. Cordially. This document has been electronically signed by S5-6, Superintendent for the Italian Foundation. Project Mel, Site PT-4, Department of Archivology, Directorship for the Institutional Collection, Excerpt from a Monography about Project Mel, an introductory analysis of the anomaly depicted it as a weapon developed by the Reggio Instituto del Italique Anomale. Continuous research indicated subtler characteristics exemplifying a cognitive process similar to that of intelligent creatures, learning through trial and error, observation, and memorization, thus adapting to the circumstances. Instance Alpha is the most belligerent case of SCP-007-INT. It prefers being in combat-oriented exercises and watching martial performances. Alpha has demonstrated a certain degree of infatuation to the party with in its conception, the best performance by using its pseudopods in attempts to imitate some executed movements for the respective party to see. Instance Beta is an exemplary case of personality. I have witnessed Beta abducting a stuffed penguin irresponsibly given by one of its operators, to demonstrate affection. Beta also displayed excitement when presented with pictures of penguins. An extraordinary situation involving Beta happened when it parted itself. Its copy assumed the form of a penguin, which Beta perceived to care for in the likeness of an animal companion. Beta protected and guided the copy through the training course until the spontaneous expiration thereof. Instance Gamma possesses a particularly high physical intelligence. 
It is expressly competent in solving movement-related problematics, such as obstacle courses involving the manipulation of sensitive objects, and complex movement, and transformative patterns. Interestingly, Gamma has been seen reacting to music by dancing to the respective rhythm. Unsurprisingly, the Academy viewed these anomalous properties inherently connected to the materia prima of the anomaly as the perfect base for technological breakthroughs. Project Oniric is a remarkable initiative. Such notoriety attracted the interest of a rogue organization that managed to acquire parcels of associated technology. An artificial tissue designated Oniric Weave, a substance of dreams, malleable such as the mythological Onderoi. The Oniric Weave is an intriguing material. It synthesizes the concept of 007 INT to the molecular level, the capability of transmutation. Project Mel was a preliminary display of the capabilities thereof. The creation of a homunculus requires myriad idiosyncratic components, which in turn, requires subcomponents that require raw materials. Imagine producing each component using a singular primary commodity that serves as a base that can be programmed to assume the necessary characteristics of the necessary assets. Similarly to stem cells, the oniric weave can be artificially created and differentiate it into specialized components with select and consistent characteristics. Dr. Nathan L. Apontis, Specialist in the Scientific Academy of the Anomalous Special Containment Procedures SCP-007-INT-Delta is contained in a modular cell divided into four areas – bedroom, living room, atelier, and courtyard. Each vicinity is under continuous audio-visual surveillance and furnished simulating the respective ordinary environment. The containment cell is located in the Special Purpose Facilities of the Department of Thaumaturgy on Site PT-4, inert in a trans-dimensional, thaumaturgically simulated environment that may be controlled per necessity, accessible through the cell doors and windows. Asset Related to Project Illusionary World The maintenance of assets and commodities is performed on schedule preventively or by request, if approved by the current project manager. Pieces produced by SCP-007-INT-Delta are to be conservated and maintained following standardized preservation protocols. Description. A peculiarity, Subject Delta is a homunculus created via the psychophysical reprogramming of an ordinary instance of SCP-007-INT. Subject Delta possesses identical abilities to that of a common instance. Its capabilities of transmutation and of causing damage haptically have been neutered through biotechnological interventions. Subject Delta exhibits complex physiognomical features with the aesthetics of an adult female, specifically resembling Professor Emilia Cavallo. Subject Delta emulates physiological characteristics with limited phenotypic traits. Additionally, Subject Delta manifests complex psychological traits. It is capable of identifying and rationalizing itself through the use of ideas. Subject Delta attends by the anthroponym of male, considering itself a female, exemplifying the reasoning through logical and behavioral reason. Incidentally, Delta is capable of experiencing and associating emotions and feelings. It is capable of experiencing qualia, particular knowledge of an abstract concept learning sciences, systematic knowledge in conjunction with globalized objective ideas, and the ability to utilize fine arts for the representation of its ideas. Extraordinarily, following the expiration of its original operator during the 1972 Christmas incident, Subject Delta has refused to establish a relationship with any other individual. The Oniric Mail Incident Site PT-4 Department of Archivology Directorship for the Institutional Collection Excerpt from the reports about the Oniric Mail Incident Several security breaches occurred in multiple storehouses and special vaults during the night of December 25, 1972, through a period of two hours. We are still calculating how many assets were subtracted and conducting investigations to allude to the events. The group of six rogue individuals responsible for the assault in the special vault containing the asset referring to the experiments conducted by Project Mel was rapidly dispatched by the responsible Rapid Response Security Teams. 
obstinate to their success in safekeeping, related assets were stolen from vaults of the medical department by a group led by the former department head, including several prototype prosthetics and documents associated with Project Oniric. The involvement of personnel associated with the Academy was not a singular case. Several captured and downed rogue elements were also students, professors, and scientists employed in our facilities. It is unclear whether these individuals were sleeper agents, given their history in the organization, or were coerced by a third party. The captured individuals that underwent interrogation expired during the procedures. One captive survived, though they are currently under animated suspension through thaumaturgic means. New security measures are being devised, while the current measures are being revised. Captain Alberto Oliveira Item number SCP-1517-JP Object Class Safe Euclid Provisional Special Containment Procedures All discovered SCP-1517-JP instances are to be brought into containment by a mobile task force from a nearby containment site. Following this, the entity is to be contained in a nearby site's reinforced humanoid containment unit and constantly monitored by means of video recording. Archived Containment Procedures Special Containment Procedures SCP-1517-JP is to be contained in a reinforced humanoid containment unit at Site DE. Constant monitoring is to be carried out by means of video recording. SCP-1517-JP is a group of military combat humanoid droids, measuring 1.81 meters in height and massing 155 kilograms. Currently, the Foundation has contained two instances, respectively designated Dash 1 and Dash 2. See Addendum 5. While obscured to the age of wear, the remnants of a Hakenkreutz painted on the SCP-1517-JP's right shoulder are recognizable. The form of the swastika used by Nazi Germany. The following inscription is present on the back of each object. W-200, Ross, 1940 Based on the contents, it can be determined that these objects were created by Mr. Ross, the leader of the Group of Interest, Fourth Reich, during his work for the Third Reich. SCP-1517-JP are primarily composed of an alloy closely similar to high-grade duralumin. The object's eyes are made of glass and are suspected to be capable of sight. SCP-1517-JP is entirely mechanical, and active entities are capable of autonomous movement. As SCP-1517-JP instances are highly resilient, inspection of their internals is difficult. In addition, as they possess a slow-acting ability for self-repair, the object is impossible to fully neutralize. Some of the SCP-1517-JP currently in containment are in an inactive state. Inspection of the interior of these entities has shown that there is an empty space in their chest, which indicates that their power source has been removed. Following the defeat of Nazi Germany in 1945, SCP-1517-JP-1, in an inactive state, was retrieved by the main Foundation. Up until the discovery of SCP-1517-JP-2, SCP-1517-JP-1 was thought to be an isolated anomaly. Addendum 1 From the retrieved documentation, prior to becoming active, SCP-1517-JP-1 possessed the following abilities. Artificial Intelligence The ability to fire machine guns attached to both arms. A high degree of physical ability. Further research into the object is planned. Addendum 2 On 1946, while investigating post-war Japan, the Foundation discovered a similar object to SCP-1517-JP-1 in a forest in Iwo Jima, and moved to the Site 81 AZ, now a part of Ogasawara Subprefecture, Tokyo. Following this, the entity discovered in Germany was designated SCP-1517-JP-1, 
and the newly discovered instance in Japan was designated Dash 2. SCP-1517 JP-2 was discovered to possess traces of a Nishoki painted on its left shoulder, and was in an inactive state similar to SCP-1517 JP-1. The Rising Sun Flag of Imperial Japan Based on the area surrounding its retrieval location, it is suspected that SCP-1517 JP-2 was in use in a combat capacity. Investigations ongoing. Between February 19, 1945, and March 26, 1945, the island was the site of a battle of Iwo Jima between the Japanese and American armies. Addendum 3 Following investigation revealed that SCP-1517 JP-2 was sent to the Empire of Japan at the signing of the Tripartite Pact between Germany, Italy, and Japan. Following this, SCP-1517 JP-2 was under the management of the Imperial Japanese Army and was used in combat multiple times. Addendum 4 With this discovery, the Foundation carried out an interview with a former Nazi scientist. Interviewee Vladimir Holman Interviewer Agent Marks Note, Vladimir Holman was involved with Nazi scientific research projects. Following the arrival of the Foundation, he was taken into custody as he was thought to be involved in the creation of various anomalous objects. Begin recording. Agent Marks, let's start the interview. Holman, understood. Do you know about SCP-1517-JP, or rather, I believe you called it W-200? Yes, and in fact it was a collaboration between Ross and myself. Please tell me more. In 1940, Julian from the Totenkamp asked me to make a duplicate of a robot for him. The same year, I reported that I had successfully duplicated it, and the same day it was decided that I'd work with Ross. Dacius Julian, a member of the 3rd SS Panzer Division, who is close to Mr. Ross, appears to have surrendered to the Allies on May 2, 1945 but information on this is unclear. Refers to the 3rd SS Panzer Division. The same day? Yes. Either way, Ross seemed to be involved in making droids for a decent while before that. However, in order to do that, he needed people, experience, and a prototype. And at that point, he was looking for people. Though I don't know if it's just my conceit, he might have marked me since long ago. Go on. After that, Ross and I made the W-200. Ross had put a duplication mechanism on them, so that they could be manufactured infinitely. After the practical test, though it was just a prototype, we started to use them as disposable weapons. Perhaps we produced them in the right numbers. I see. But if you were to make so many of them, it'd drain the country's coffers, no? Would that not be a problem? No. The party immediately saw that. However, Ross immediately started work on another kind of droid. At that point, Julian had another idea. Go on. He suggested we sell the W-200 to other groups, and we took his idea. Who did you sell them to? There weren't that many of them, but they were quite large scale. The main ones were Prometheus and Marshall Carter and Dark but we also made sales of smaller ones. When sales were hard, we had to sell them off via hearsay and hide their origins. And also, when we made the pact with Japan and Italy, as a gift of goodwill, we sent a W-200 to each company. Soon enough, the W-200 were not used for much other than as a product. And did that help the combat prospects of the Nazis? It let us expand our territory in 41, I believe. After that, we used the money from sales to fund more robot production and droid research. That proposal really gave the higher-ups a lot of material to do that, but in the end, we failed. We were attacked by the Soviets, and the droids were destroyed. There can't be too many of them left. That's all I know. As for where the last W-200s went, I'm sorry, but I don't know. Thank you for the information. We'll end it here. End recording. From the information obtained, 
it was later determined that the object was used in Project Reversing the Reversal. Project Reversing the Reversal was a project under the direct leadership of Hitler to create robot squadrons in order to protect important bases and high-ranking Nazi officials, as well as for rapid maneuverability and combat. Addendum 5 Following the interview, the Foundation conducted a further investigation of the information retrieved from the Nazi science program. Following this, suppression of various groups of interest indicated in the documents led to the retrieval of 17 further SCP-1517-JP instances, both active and inactive, which have been designated SCP-1517-JP-3-19 through and stored in nearby containment sites. As active instances are confirmed to exist, the containment procedures have been revised, and the object class has been raised to Euclid. Further changes of object class are in consideration. Item number SCP-009-DE Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures Newly discovered specimens of SCP-009-DE-1 are to be torn down as soon as possible. MTF-DE-9-T Tankwort is currently monitoring social networks and is investigating reports about vehicles under the influence of SCP-009-DE-2 to locate and destroy new specimens. Specimens that are contained for research purposes do not require any maintenance. Except for tests, no motor may be operated filled with SCP-009-DE-2. SCP-009-DE-1 describes a series of automated petrol stations. Instances of SCP-009-DE-1 appear spontaneously on the territory of the Federal Republic of Germany. See Addendum 009-DE-2. All instances of SCP-009-DE-1 have the same appearance and have the same components. One unit consists of a price mast, three petrol pumps, each with a customer terminal, up to two hoses and nozzles and a roof. Various products and services are advertised on all components of SCP-009-DE-1. The design of SCP-009-DE-1's customer terminal differs from that of conventional devices. All credit and bank cards are accepted without exception, as long as they are approved and adequately covered. It is also possible to use cash of any internationally recognized currency for payment. The device works otherwise like a usual customer terminal. SCP-009-DE-1 has a large selection of fuels, here and after collectively referred to as SCP-009-DE-2 some of which are normally not available in the Federal Republic of Germany. The SCP-009-DE-1 dispensers can dispense all offered variants of SCP-009-DE-2 without measurable impurities, although each of them has only two hoses and nozzles. However, it seems that if Petrol Pump 1 only delivers diesel fuels, while Petrol Pump 2 provides all other fuels, with the exception of a significantly higher density. All types of SCP-009-DE-2 are physically and chemically identical to their non-anomalous counterparts. SCP-009-DE-2 powered engines that are not used for locomotion start up, but the engine stops almost immediately. Vehicle engines operated with SCP-009-DE-2, on the other hand, show increased performance initially, but side effects occur with continuous use. These side effects gradually affect the vehicle in three stages. Stage 1. One to two weeks after the first use of SCP-009-DE-2, the engine power drops back to the normal level. The weight of the vehicle increases slightly. Stage 2. Three to five weeks after the onset of Stage 1, engine performance drops to a below average level. Dents start to form on the surface of the vehicle, increasing its mass. Stage 3. Four to six weeks after the onset of Stage 2. Engine performance drops even further. Engine, air conditioning, and vehicle electronics become susceptible to malfunctions. The bumps expand and start to cover headlights and intake openings. During this process, the mass of the vehicle continues to increase, 
until either the intake openings are completely covered, the chassis collapses under the weight or, in the case of a watercraft, its buoyancy is no longer sufficient to keep it afloat. The highest weight ever documented was reached by a Bell AZ-75710 large dump truck and was measured at 1,598.3 tons. The duration of each stage varies between vehicles. In addition, SCP-009-DE-2 side effects can be prevented by driving the vehicle a lot and transporting heavy loads with it. If an effective vehicle is operated with fuel other than SCP-009-DE-2 for a sufficient period of time, it will gradually return to its standard state. The reversion takes place in all cases, no matter what stage the vehicle is in. However, should such a vehicle be operated again with SCP-009-DE-2, the side effects set in much faster and more violently. Another way to neutralize the side effects is to replace affected parts with unaffected ones. However, these new parts will also be affected by SCP-009-DE-2 side effects if they are used to continue to operate the vehicle afterwards. Instances of SCP-009-DE-1 appear on busy roads at night without warning. Typical places of appearance are rest stops or vacant lots. The materialization process has never been documented, since the time and the exact location of their occurrence are impossible to predict at the moment. Once they have appeared, they remain in their place indefinitely. It is also possible to find several instances in one place, probably to serve a larger number of customers at the same time. SCP-009-DE-1 attracts customers by adjusting the price of all of its fuels so that they are significantly cheaper at any time than any other gas station within a 60km radius. If a copy suffers damage that does not render the customer terminal and both petrol pumps unusable, it will return to its original condition within one nanosecond at midnight. If a specimen is damaged to such an extent that its customer terminal and both petrol pumps are no longer functional, it loses all of its anomalous properties. To date, the investigation of contained specimens has provided only limited information. It is unknown how SCP-009-DE-1 gathers information about fuel prices, which bank receives the funds that are transferred to its customer terminal, and where it obtains SCP-009-DE-2 from, since no destroyed instance so far had an underground tank. It was also not possible to find out how cash leaves the customer terminal. Coin-shaped GPS trackers, which are inserted into the coin slot of SCP-009-DE-1's customer terminal, simply remain in it and, in contrast to real coins, can be recovered when the terminal is destroyed. Addendum 009-DE-1 Newly discovered specimens of SCP-009-DE-1 are now able to output electricity for electric vehicles and have a corresponding device in each petrol pump. The electricity, designated SCP-009-DE-3, has the same anomalous properties as SCP-009-DE-2. Where SCP-009-DE-1 gets its electricity from is unknown. Addendum 009-DE-2 Observations show that the rate at which new instances of SCP-009-DE-1 appear has been increasing steadily in recent years. There are now SCP-009-DE-1 sightings in several Western and Central European countries, as well as Canada and the United States. We are trying to protect you. Aura Orin. MTF Omega Zero. Look away. Item number SCP-1397 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures All SCP-1397-2 detection and liquidation interactions are to be maintained by MTF-8 of 10's forces. SCP-1397 Unknown creature that poses a cognito hazard. Its observable appearance looks like an earthworm tail section with specific segmentation, of a pale pink color with the size of an adult's head. It also contains clotellum, specific for earthworms, and a single, big, wide-open human eye with signs of glaucoma. 
SCP-1397 only appears from SCP-1397-2, and also causes the creation of the latter, if observed by someone. This way, effect is interdependent, and starts off from some unknown zero case. SCP-1397-2, any human, that ever observed SCP-1397 by one of these ways. In any crowded place, in which SCP-1397-2 and thereafter SCP-1397 can appear. On the internet, in any website or local digital data storage with SCP-1397-2 or SCP-1397 photos, even if image display function is disabled or impossible at all. Remarkable is the fact that photos of humans that observed SCP-1397 that way will appear on random websites or local storage, even if subject never made any photo. At the first time it will be free of any defects, but when subject themselves will pass through all stages of metamorphosis see below, it will change according to this. On this picture, in random periods of time, SCP-1397 can appear, continuing cognitive infection. According to MTF 8 attempts data, effects don't spread on the images of SCP-1397-2 that already converted, because they're already separated from the original interdependent chain. We are trying to protect you. After subject's observation of SCP-1397, they start to suffer from irreversible mental disorders. That happens in three stages. 1. The emergence of dysmorphophobic ideas about the inferiority of one's own face. 2. A period of intense nightmares that contents an act of long-term observation of one's own face from the side that ends with something frightening not having objectivity at the same time, that makes you immediately wake up. 3. Visceral hallucinations, including objective depiction of a cavity inside one's head. Immediately after last stages end, big, black circle-like areas appear in the subject's head region, forcing a subject's face to bend around it, similar to gravitational lensing effect. See image. That circle looks two-dimensional from any perspective. Apparently, local space's metrics itself changes. From that area, SCP-1397 appears, and then, after a short period of time, disappears. It's unknown if SCP-1397 can appear in multiple SCP-1397-2 at the same time. After transformation, SCP-1397-2 loses any psychological depth or personality in its behavior, along with any biological needs. Subjects aimlessly roam in areas that are familiar for them. After a long time, all SCP-1397-2 instances strive to encounter each other and start interacting. They contact each other with black areas in their heads. After that, those areas start to merge and become bigger. Faces of SCP-1397-2 bend around newly formed space, creating single enclosed rings. Purposes and consequences of those interactions are currently unknown, because of MTF-8 attempt preventing them from happening, but they have a strong potential of a K-class scenario. Item number SCP-ZH-038 Threat Level Green Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures Currently, 10 found SCP-ZH-038 instances are contained at Site ZH-02. Each instance has to be stored individually in a containment compartment. All compartment walls and floors are covered with impact-resistant material to prevent the action of items damaging themselves or the compartment. If personnel need to enter the compartment, the motion of the enterer should be slowed down. All aggressive postures and direct vision of the object's face are prohibited. SCP-ZH-038 is a type of female mannequin. The model's head has a smooth surface with no facial features. In the inactive state, the models remain static standing posture, with two hands on the sides. At present, the composition of the model is still unknown. In the material test, 
a result similar to glass fiber is retrieved. SCP-ZH-038 activates when one or more humans are approaching. Activated SCP-ZH-038 would imitate all actions of the closest human. It has been observed that its imitation is not limited by its composition or the finite number of joints. All actions have a nearly perfect synchronization. When the imitated target enters the area where they can directly observe SCP-ZH-038, the item's face would liquefy, distort, and transform into a face identical to the target. It would keep gazing at the target. The target would feel anxiety under the gaze and trigger the fight-or-flight response. Moreover, the cognition of imitated target would be damaged when undergoing observation of SCP-ZH-038's face. All cases of observation resulted in prosopagnosia to the target's own face. The affliction is irreversible. All attempts at memory rebuilding and cognition therapy are failed. Addendum SCP-ZH-038 has been placed in the crowded public area multiple times as public art by members of a new Anarch group. We are the coolest. The following text is found on the walls and floors near the exhibition space. Identical sisters, like two sides of a mirror, wear the same clothes, hear the same music. Identical sisters lost their faces and bicker. Both are content, since obscure is also beauty. Are we cool yet? We are the coolest. Kiku and Shiroku.